the idea for it in 1986. So I must confess that I hardly recognize the person who wrote this book uh, as a true process philosopher. I've done two books uh, from this one at the moment. Um, now, nonetheless, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to go back into, into it and uh, think about the central issues. So in this book, I defend um, three theses. And uh, at the time in which I was sort of thinking about this, it was Donald Davidson who um, brought the subject of the ontological status of events into the philosophical mainstream, albeit within the context of linguistic philosophy and descriptive metaphysics, which is the, what I'm basically arguing against uh, in the dialectical process between what Peter Strawson called revisionary metaphysics and descriptive metaphysics. Uh, so um, the main theses of this book are naturalized metaphysics against what I call a pure metaphysics or transcendental metaphysics. Uh, that is a scientifically informed metaphysics against the tradition that contends that truths in metaphysics can be achieved independent of science. So my heroes in this regard are Alfred North Whitehead, Bertrand Russell, C.D. Broad, and uh, W.V. Quine, or proponents of what I call the naturalized metaphysics. Uh, and they figure into the book in uh, various ways. Um, secondly, that events are ontologically basic against the substance metaphysics in the tradition of Aristotle, Strawson, uh, and Davidson et al. Uh, so if I understood uh, Professor DeCaro's lecture this morning, uh, defending metaphysics as continuous with science, I think we're going to see a lot of uh, uh, parallelism here. Uh, so both one and two broadly fall under the category of Strawson's revisionary versus descriptive metaphysics. And I see Whitehead, Russell, Broad, and Quine as all defending a revisionary metaphysics. The third thesis I defend in this book is an ontology of events has certain advantages for the possibility of achieving a unified theory of physics. So much of my book discusses the relevance of Einstein's theory of relativity, Maxwell's electromagnetic theory, and quantum theory as the basis for an ontology of events. And I think it's, it's pretty solidly established in this regard that most physicists, if they think about ontology at all, would probably willing to commit to the idea that, yeah, um, events are basic. Uh, so it's in uh, these major works um, that I'm mainly focusing on, uh, Whitehead's Principles of Natural Knowledge, in which he's there in that part of his philosophical development, he's defending a kind of four-dimensionalism in, inspired by uh, Einstein's theory of relativity, but then he changes his view and uh, we get an, an entirely different sorts of view and process in reality in 1929 when he moves to a more comprehensive theory. Um, C.D. Broad's 1923 book, Scientific Thought, Broad says that he's basically following the lead of Whitehead and Quine, sorry, not Whitehead and Quine, Whitehead and Russell in putting forward an ontology of events in that work. Russell in the analysis of matter and in other works in uh, 1927 is where he is mainly espousing an ontology of events. Uh, and then of course, uh, Quine's word and object and other papers such as Wither Physical Objects in which he too defended an ontology of events. Uh, so why an ontology of events? Well, I argue that ontological economy is achieved by admitting nothing but events and properties. Events are the concrete basic particulars. Everything else is abstraction. Objects, that is to say physical objects, are explained in, in terms of Whitehead's concept of societies uh, of events and substances in Aristotle's sense of self-same centers of change don't exist. So we eliminated that whole sort of category of ontology. Um, so in this lecture, I'm going to focus on the more difficult and controversial parts of my book, 
uh, namely dealing with the unification of modern physics. Uh, the unification of modern physics is an ontological problem because our theories of the large scale structure of space time and the small scale micro physical quantum phenomena are presently incompatible. That is to say, we have no comprehensive unified theory. So I see the, the unification problem as an ontological problem, and, I, and I'm looking for uh, Whitehead as, as a kind of source of synthesizing, uh, if, if indeed that is plausible. The former, that is to say, um, relativity theory is deterministic while quantum theory is probabilistic. Uh, and then we've got a completely different conception of time to deal with in, in terms of the unification problem. Okay, so why unification? Well, why is it important to have unified theories as opposed to having uh, a number of fragmentary disunified theories? Well, unified theories offer theoretical simplification achieved in the form of elegant equations and broad explanatory and predictive power. They're the central focus of theoretical physics and scientific progress is often measured in terms of success toward this goal. Next, the great advances in physics were achieved when previously believed separate phenomena were discovered to be aspects of the same phenomenon. So celestial and terrestrial motions were united in Newton's law of gravitation. Electricity, magnetism, and light were unified in the electromagnetic theories of Faraday and Maxwell. Mass and energy were fused in Einstein's special theory of relativity. Space and time were united in his special and general theories of relativity. Um, so if we look at the unification project, that's just to say in our current paradigm, moving toward uh, what might be called a theory of everything, or on this particular chart, the theoretical unification is M theory. We start with electricity and magnetism as the forces unified by Maxwell and electromagnetism. Then um, um, the electroweak unification comes from unifying electromagnetism and the weak force, and that was achieved mainly by uh, Weinberg and colleagues. The grand unification then, which unifies the strong force. And then finally, how, do, how is it that we get gravity unified with these other um, reasonably successful parts of theory unified? I don't think at this moment we have the grand unification that, we've, that we have actually unified st the strong force, correct? Uh, then there's a standard model of particle physics, which describes the three of the four known fundamental forces, electromagnetic, weak, and strong interactions, but it does not account for the gravitational force or the accelerating expansion of the universe. <clears throat> now, a word of warning um, from Alexander Pope, fools rush in where angels fear to tread, and I'm gonna modify this just a little bit. Uh, philosophers rush in where physicists fear to tread. So I'm somewhat diffident about addressing this subject. I, I know just enough about it to know what I don't know and, and sort of falling into somewhat dangerous territory here. Nonetheless, uh, we're gonna, gonna give it a go. Um, according to Steven Weinberg, the advances thus far have been achieved by dazzling work in physics and mathematics, not by philosophical speculation. That is to say, hounds, sniffing about the ground rather than hawks high above seeing general patterns. So he thinks that it's a bottom up, not a top down approach that has given us so far the successes in unification. So what is it that philosophers have to contribute to this? Well, that's what I hope to add by the end of this talk and what I attempted to do in my book. So I modestly, offer a few observations about the problem and some suggestions as to how Whitehead and others advance some direction toward a solution based on the reality of time in a top-down hawk's approach rather than dog sniffing about the ground. So now we come to Whitehead on unification. And this project, I think, 
uh, I think Whitehead really did sort of know the name of the game in physics was unification. And even in 1929, he was attempting to, to, to what some people would call a megalomaniac enterprise by attempting to produce a theory of everything, not only physics, but also unifying physics with biology and all other sorts of, of, of our experiences, aesthetic values, religion, psychology, so on and so forth. Um, and so Whitehead, I thought, is, is really the, the genius of, 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 of seeing how to generalize uh, concepts that would produce unification. Um, but this was 1929, well before the weak and strong nuclear forces had been discovered. And it was the same problem for Einstein in attempting a unified field theory that sought a unification of general relativity and electromagnetism in the 1920s. While Einstein assumed the fundamental correctness of general relativity, he was well aware of the difficulty of unification with quantum mechanics. Perhaps he didn't quite realize uh, the, just exactly how difficult it would be. But the crux of the matter, for me, at least in, in the book that I put forward here, is how to reconcile two very different concepts of time in relativity theory and quantum mechanics. Uh, in this connection, it's the physicist, Chris Isham and Henry Stapp, who recognized that at the most general theoretical level, the unification of physics depended on a consistent theory of time. So I'm following their lead. In quantum theory, time is understood as classical, clock time, ticking away independent of the quantum system. Also in thermodynamics and electromagnetic radiation, these theories support the idea of an irreversible arrow of time and an open future. So that's one concept of time. Uh, the other um, is in relativity theory, namely einstein minkowskis four-dimensional block universe where time is inseparable from space-time. Since temporal order is influenced by the distribution of matter, space-time subordinates time to a geometrization of the temporal, and time's flow is treated as an illusory subjective phenomenon. Ordinary objects in the space-time look like space-time worms stretched out where from beginning to end, um, past, present, and future all look as if they are eternally present. So, so time um, is really radically different in these two different um, disunified by parts of physics. And, and, and the, the, the question here is how can uh, these theories be modified in such a way with regard to time, at least to show us a path toward what that unification might look like. Um, Einstein said, since the mathematicians have invaded the theory of relativity, I do not understand it myself anymore. This was a reference to Minkowski's geometrical interpretation of special relativity. But when Einstein formulated the general theory of relativity, he acknowledged the indispensability of Minkowski's interpretation. So again, the question raised by Einstein in 1948 is whether general relativity or quantum theory is the more basic theoretical concept. Is time real or unreal? Is our basic system probabilistic or deterministic? Stephen Hawking was confident in the 1980s that we would have our answer in a unified theory uh, by the millennium but we don't seem to really be any closer today. So here's what Hawking said in Black Holes and Baby Universes. I want to discuss the possibility that the goal of theoretical physics might be achieved in the not too distant future, say by the end of this century. By this, I mean that we might have a complete, consistent and unified theory of the physical interactions that would describe all possible observations. Okay, so it looks like I was a little bit too optimistic uh, in, in terms of uh, that prediction. Now, Whitehead and Russell thought that an ontology of events would provide a general unifying concept because both quantum theory and relativity theory support the idea that events are basic. Okay, so here's the direction from which I take my inspiration. And the physicist Henry Stapp 
and Millick Capek agreed, both relativity theory and quantum theory would have to go undergo modifications in order to achieve the final unification. In physics, this is relativistic quantum field theory. And in philosophy, it looks like C.D. Broad's growing block universe. By the way, I used to think that Whitehead was a presentist. That is to say, uh, only the present exists for subjective immediacy in the actual occasions and in the becoming of, uh, of God. Uh, but I had to radically review, uh, revise my view uh, and see Whitehead as espousing the type of block universe when I, when I wrote this book. Uh, both in philosophy and physics, it looks like you're, they're advancing the idea of an asymmetry of time with an open future and a fixed past. So <clears throat> another major stumbling block here to unification is the Copenhagen interpretation. Something has definitely got to go. The first problem here is rejection of Bohr's Copenhagen interpretation, according to which speculation into the microstructure of nature is forbidden. As Bohr made the point, the formalism does not allow a pictorial representation along accustomed lines, but aims directly at establishing relations between observations obtained under well-defined conditions. So the problem with quantum theory becomes ambiguous ad hoc non-explanatory and restricted in scope and resistant to unification with the rest of physics. It's enormously successful in its application of the formulism to the phenomenon, but it fails as a complete comprehensive theory. For example, Bohr's complementarity dodges the wave particle problem rather than providing a solution to it. So as opposed to the instrumentalist or the epistemic interpretation of quantum phenomena, the orthodox or the Copenhagen interpretation of Bohr and Heisenberg, the unification demands a robust realism about quantum objects, that is to say, an ontological interpretation. The physical theory should clearly address two fundamental questions, what there is and what it does. That is to say, the ontology of the theory and the dynamics of the theory and the Copenhagen interpretation fails to provide both. So if we reject the orthodox Copenhagen theory and move in the direction of taking ontology seriously, it looks like physics has advanced at least five different candidates here for an ontology of quantum mechanics. And these include but sorry, four of them, it includes the pilot wave ontology, the many worlds ontology, spontaneous reduction, and the actual events ontology, that is the relativistic quantum field theory. So I'm just gonna focus on the actual events ontology because that's the one that um, it looks like gives us the best possibility of revising this concept of time to, uh, achieve some potential unification. So the actual events ontology is Stapp's name for the Whiteheadian quantum ontology that incorporates some of Heisenberg's main principles. Whitehead's events, or actual occasions as he calls them, are functionally similar to the collapses of the wave functions in the quantum mechanics. Contrasted with the Copenhagen interpretation, the wave function is not treated merely as a mathematical tool, for calculating correlations between observations, but is a representation of the world itself. Okay, so there's the robust realism. Secondly, according to Stapp, there's a choice that's happening in nature at some very basic level. And this corresponds to what we call Whitehead's prehensive activity of actual occasions. Third, the collapse of the waves function is a transition from the potential to the actual events or as Heisenberg put it, the Aristotelian potentia introduced something standing in the middle between the idea of an event and the actual event, a strange kind of physical reality, just in the middle between possibility and reality. So when Stapp describes the functional similarity between Whitehead's ontology and quantum mechanics, he has in mind the idea of explaining how the discrete emerges from the content continuous namely how a particle emerges from the continuous quantum smearing of possibilities. According to this model, 
elementary particles behave in ways that are similar to what Whitehead calls the epochal becoming of actual occasions. Now notice they're not to be identified because from Whitehead's point of view, uh, what's going on at this more basic ontological level is not to be uh, uh, associated or equated with what happens when once we get societies, that is to say matter and aggregates and so on and so forth. But what Stapp is saying is that there's a functional similarity here between the collapse uh, that goes on in the wave function and what Whitehead is talking about in his theory of epochal becoming. So it's especially important to note how the classical theory of time assumed in quantum theory has been modified by the actual events ontology. Instead of viewing time as existing external to the quantum system, time has an internal part of the system as a coextensive with the quantum process. Quantum phenomena are essentially temporal events as the merely potential becomes actual and successive collapses of the wave function. Okay, so time gets modified from its classical uh, conception uh, to, to something where, closer to Whitehead, where the, the, the quantum events themselves are temporal entities. So when Stapp describes this functional similarity, he has in mind the idea of explaining how the, oh, sorry, I've already gone there backwards. Now, so now we have the question of um, what has to go in relativity theory? How is mod mo there going to be a modification of, of time in uh, Einstein's theory of relativity? That's the other half of the unification. So just as quantum theory has to be modified, so does relativity theory. We must be prepared to give up on the idea of an a priori given space-time, the four-dimensionalism in which time is treated as an illusory subjective phenomenon. For example, Einstein famously said, the distinction between past, present, and future is, is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. That's got to go. This move was anticipated by Capic, who devoted much of his work to defending the reality of temporal becoming against what he calls the fallacy of spatialization in the einstein minkowski model of space-time. For Capic, relativity theory need not be interpreted according to the Iliadic tradition of viewing the world as a timeless four-dimensional entity. But since the theory of gravity and Einstein's general relativity is seen as firmly established in physical theory, most physicists will be resistant to the idea that its rejection is the key to the final unification. If, however, the standard interpretation of Einstein's theory is modified without necessarily in, uh, modifying any of the direct changes to the formalism, one major stumbling block towards a potential unified theory could be removed. Quantum theory and a theory of gravity can be unified by a process model of time that preserves the distinction between past, present, and future and views extension as a self-organizing system emerging from dynamic temporal processes. Stapp's synthesis, as I shall call it, attempts this unification via the Whitehead-Heisenberg interpretation of quantum phenomena supplemented by developments in relativistic quantum field theory. It was Tim Malden who offered this alternative conceptual apparatus in the theory of linear, linear structures in response to the complaint that the traditional geometry of relativity theory spatializes time. There is a choice involved as to which mathematical tools one uses to represent the geometry of space-time, and a new foundation can be built on the notion of a line or a directed line that temporalizes space. Okay, so instead of spatializing time, we have a slight modification here of temporalizing space. Uh, Reginald Cahill also defends the process physics against the four dimensionalism of general relativity. But what must be preserved in this new synthesis is a denial of the universal cosmic now demanded by special relativity. In other words, uh, that which was fundamental to Newtonian physics, um, an instantaneous cosmic now, 
has to be rejected. This was developed by um, Tamanago and Schwinger in the 1940s and 50s. The crucial idea, according to Stapp, is that the advancing succession of flat instants on the non-relativistic theory upon which the collapse occurs are replaced by advancing sequences of space-like surfaces where advancing means at every point on the space-like surface either coincides with a point on that preceding surface, but inside the open forward light cone of some of the points of the preceding surface. The succession of space-like surfaces on the collapse occurs advanced locally into the future. Now, that, if that's completely unintelligible, I'll try to make some sense out of it, and I hope Tom will as well. Stapp notes that the agreement of these ideas with Whitehead's philosophy of organism, wherein the fixed and settled facts grow via sequences of actual occasions. In effect, the development of nature resembles cell growth, except that instead of developing within a pre-given space-time, it is time-space itself that is developing. Each occasion is a separate time-space region that fuses with the existing space, time-space regions of the settled past. So instead of conceiving of the leading edge of reality as a moving knife edge of time, each occasion advances the boundary surface with all the other occasions completing their concrescences simultaneously with that occasion. This means that from the point of view of each concressing occasion, there is a fixed past and an open future. Now, how does this fit with philosophical theories of time? Well, we basically have three different theories here. Eternalism, which is the four-dimensionalist theory espoused by the likes of um, Parmenides, Einstein, Minkowski, Santayana, and also McTaggart. Presentism, which is a three-dimensional view, uh, mainly espoused by Aristotle and Newton and the growing block universe or relativized three-dimensionalism espoused by Broad and also, I think, Whitehead. The relativistic quantum field theory with its proposal of an open future and a fixed past naturally brings to mind the theory espoused by C.D. Broad in the 1920s, namely the growing block universe, according to which physical reality at any moment consists of space-time block of present and past events, but no future events, and the block grows with the passage of time. How are we doing on time here, Tom? You've had half an hour, so you've got plenty of time. So Broad developed this theory to preserve the notion of the passage and the distinct arrow of time against those theorists who viewed the universe to be a fixed block where nothing really happens. In other words, we have a more sort of dynamic picture of reality growing here. Now, um, so, we, so just to sort of sum up here, um, how are we gonna achieve this unification? The problem of time is basic because we have two completely incompatible theories of time and these two well-established parts of physics. Uh, and so the idea is that both have to give something up. Both relativity theory and quantum mechanics have to give something up in order to move in the direction of, of, of a, a consistent unified theory of time. And so physicists like Stapp have proposed the idea of a relativistic um, uh, field, quantum field theory as uh, as the closest to actually achieving something of this sort. Now, this is a postscript on John Bell's flash ontology. It turns out that unbeknownst to me that, um, that John Bell had proposed an event ontology as well. Uh, and I didn't get to, to include this in my book because I didn't know about um, Bell's work. I knew about his theorem, but I was un I didn't know anything about his his ontological speculations. So um, it was Tim Walden's book on 
philosophy of physics quantum theory that included this interesting discussion of Bell's ontology, what is called uh, uh, an ontology of local beables. So here's what Bell says in the speakable and unspeakable in quantum mechanics. The terminology beable as against observable is not designed to frighten with metaphysic, those dedicated to real physics. It is chosen rather to help in making explicit some notions already implicit in and basic to ordinary quantum theory. For in the words of Bohr, it is decisive to recognize that however far the phenomena transcend the scope of classical physical explanation, the account of all evidence must be expressed in classical terms. It is the ambition of the local beables, theory of local beables, to bring these classical terms into the equations and not relegate them entirely to surrounding talk. So that I take it is, is, is Bell's rejection of orthodox quantum theory, the instrumentalist interpretation in favor of the uh, some, something that takes ontology seriously. And he calls this uh, beables. So in proposing his theory of local beables, Bell sought to solve the measurement problem in quantum theory and Schrodinger's cat problem. Fixing the distribution of local beables at a microscopic scale fixes the location, shape, and motion of their macroscopic aggregates. Um, once again, quoting from Bell in Speakable and Unspeakable in Quantum Mechanics, there is nothing in this theory but the wave function. It is in the wave function that we must find an image of the physical world. Um, the GRW jumps, which are part of the wave function, not something else, are well localized in ordinary space. Indeed, each is centered on a particular space-time point, x, y, x, t. So we can propose these events as the mathematical counterpoints, in theory, to real events at definite places and times in the real world. A piece of matter, then, is a galaxy of such events. So um, in connection with the theory I advanced is most compatible with Whitehead's ontology of events, Bell has first of all re rejected the epistemic approach. Uh, and secondly, what he calls a flash ontology is that the localized material content of space-time is not particles, nor continuously distributed feel-like entities, nor vibrating strings, but rather events. So in conclusion, uh, in the event universe, I've made my case for adopting Whitehead's approach to unification on the basis of two basic ideas, events and process, upon which it seems to me that fundamental ontology provides a direction at the most general level for working out solutions to the problem of unification. Whether or not Whitehead's ideas play any role at all in the theory that is finally developed and accepted it seems very likely that in broad outline, the theory's got to, got to have certain kinds of characteristics. First of all, as Einstein predicted, it will be some kind of field theory. Secondly, that either relativity theory or orthodox quantum theory or both will need to be modified. Third, that the question about the nature of time will be fundamental. Either time will be treated as an illusion a local phenomenon of, of a multidimensional universe or multiverse, or it will figure as a key feature of, rel of reality. Four, the theory will provide testable predictions, and five, the theory will have to have broad explanatory power. It is, of course, possible that there is no final unified theory, but perhaps one, an endless sequence of theories, or two, different parts of physics describing different aspects of reality with no overall ability to provide comprehensive explanations. Uh, if the first alternative, one, is correct, it seems to me to be no deterrent to the endless quest of both metaphysics and science. Just as Newton and Aristotle before him provided a coherent paradigm that gave unity and direction to physics for a time, so will the unification of relativity and quantum theory if and when it happens. A final theory, 
simply means a final step of unification in the current attempt to develop a comprehensive paradigm, not a final theory of physics. Uh, so you had lots of people, even Stephen Hawking, who sort of claim, made sort of claims to something to the effect of physics is coming to an end. There'll be nothing for physicists to do anymore. Well, it just sort of seems to me that um, when you're talking about a final theory, you're not really talking about final in, this, in the sense of the end of physics, but just final in the sense of within this, this current paradigm. So any physical theory will face the inevitable decay of a framework and the shock of a scientific revolution. The second alternative, too, presents a more challenging claim. But if we can make a very plausible assumption that nature itself is unified, then history would appear to be on the side of those who have achieved unified theories, themselves parts of more general theories. So in response to physicists such as Hawking and Weinberg, who claim that philosophy provides no useful guidance to science, it's more a matter of what kind of philosophy we're talking about, the right kind of philosophy, namely a scientifically informed metaphysics rather than bad philosophy. There's no escape from philosophy in the same way that there's no escape from the conceptual framework by which we interpret our experience. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I'm um, delighted to have this opportunity to talk about um, uh, event ontology, which is, is one of my um, passions. Uh, I am a philosopher of physics, so we're those, that special group of, of uh, philosophers whose job it is to rush in where physicists um, fear to tread, as as Lehman said, um, and so that's that's the perspective that that I'm bringing here. Um, so I have a um, a broad agreement with um, the book as a whole, which I I very much enjoyed when I um, read it first back in 2015-16. Uh, um, I think this, this philosophical project um, of, of taking up Whitehead's and Russell's um, burgeoning um, event ontology in the 1920s, which was developed in response to relativity and um, quantum mechanics or, or the, the quantum theory that they had at the time, which we tend to call the old quantum theory today, um, I think that that project still has legs. I, I agree very much um, with with Lehman's Lehman's claims. Um, my own uh, my own personal um, project is to um, offer up a, a concrete interpretation interpretation of these physical theories um, meeting the standards of my. Uh, fellow philosophers of physics. So we tend to be uh, rather more conservative than theoretical physicists. So we like to start with the parts of um, philosophy that have already a very good empirical confirmation. The, uh, no, sorry, I've just muted myself. Um, that have very good in, empirical confirmation. They have established mathematical formalisms and then an interpretation in the sense of philosophy of physics is um, a way of taking those, those symbols and applying them to, to reality, um, to experience. Um, in a sense, physicists tend to require more. A philosopher of physics is quite happy to say, yeah, that's a viable interpretation. I don't believe it, um, but sure, that's, that's a way that you could think about the physics. Um, physicists are, are more concerned with success in the sense of, of novel predictions, prediction, particularly when those can be confirmed. Um, although we might we might talk about you know string theory and um, difficulties with with empirical confirmation in theoretical physics today. Um, but my concern here is with um, Henry Stubbs' proposal, as as advocated um, by Lehman. Um, the first thing that one might say is that it's really rather sketchy indeed. It's a sort of sketch of a sketch of an interpretation. 
Um, but nonetheless, just given the broad outlines, and I agree that the, the broad outlines of what Stark um, proposes are um, Whiteheadian and sort of capture something important about Whitehead. Uh, so it's then a, a bit of a problem for someone like me that those, um, those aims don't seem to agree with, with the physics we have, with, with the way that we do um, quantum mechanics. Um, so just to sketch what that proposal is, sketch of a sketch of a sketch, as I would have it. Um, so he, he proposes to retain something of the Copenhagen interpretation, so that involves um, two processes, von Neumann's process one and process two. So process one is collapse. It's this instantaneous collapse of the quantum state. Um, process two is uh, the unitary evolution according to the Schrodinger equation. So the Schrodinger equation is just like Newton's laws, it's the dynamical equation of the quantum state. It tells you how the state changes with time. Um, so that's completely determined by the state at a time and knowledge of the Hamiltonian of the system, which is essentially the energy function. So you just have to know how the system will develop and what its state is at a time. Um, and that is uh, that will just unfold for you. Um, but process one has no dynamics in quantum theory. Nothing tells you in the theory when to apply it. Um, so there's this uh, famous debate back in 1927 um, at the Solvay conference where uh, Paul Dirac, um, discoverer of the uh, Dirac equation, the um, relativistic electron equation the following year, says, well, what happens when um, we apply claps is nature makes a choice. Um, Heisenberg in response said, no, no, it has to be the observer who makes the choice of when to measure. Um, the equations don't tell us that. Um, so it has to be a sort of independent choice um, and it can only be made by the observer. Um, and what Whitehead and Stubb seem to be saying is that the, the actual entity or actual occasion, the event that comes into being um, is making the choice. It's, it's, um, it's somehow responsible for, um, for collapse itself. Um, so if that could be made to work, that would be a great help in, in solving the, the measurement problem, this, this difficulty that we don't know when to apply claps. Do we only apply it with um, when someone enters the room? There's this quip of John Bell, you know, do we apply it when um, someone without a PhD enters the room? Do you have to have a PhD in order to count in a, as an observer? That sort of thing, it's, it seems to be rather indeterminate. So if this could be microphysics, if this could be the actual occasion, the actual entity making the choice, that would be a great, um, a great advance. Um, so here's a very suggestive diagram um, from Stupp. So we've got the fixed past, um, and the past is being added to in these slabs of becoming, these, these new events, that are um, compressing and, um, and adding to the past, this growing block, um, and the, the future remains open. So this seems to capture something of uh, Whitehead's epochal theory of time. We've got um, becoming of continuity rather than continuity of becoming. These are discrete events that um, become one after the other in, in some sense. Um, but I see uh, two problems looming. Um, so we've got process two, that's in hand. We've got the unitary evolution um, because this is uh, relativistic quantum field theory. We've got uh, the Tomonaga Schwinger formalism takes care of that. We know exactly how to do that. Um, although there are, there are problems with um, writing down a precise interacting quantum field theory that we won't go into. Um, and as I've said, we've got 
um, Whitehead's epochal theory is, is somehow um, um, suggestive of, of this particular kind of dynamics. Um, so chunks of chunks of space time coming into being one after the other. Um, but there's this uh, inconvenient fact that events in quantum mechanics have to be represented by projections. And I'll explain something about that on the next slide. Um, so that leads to problem one. Um, so this is um, related to the quantum Zeno effect that plays a role in Stubbs book, which effectively says that if you measure a system with um, ever increasing frequency, such that you're, um, you're measuring it every time, continuously many times, you freeze the dynamics. So it's kind of like um, Zeno's paradoxes of, of motion where you never quite get to the, to the end of, of the track. Um, if you're, you know, you're, you've got to cover half, then you've got to cover um, a quarter to get to three quarters and so on and so forth. So the, there's, there's sort of an analogy there but the upshot of this is that projections cannot be temporally extended. So you don't get those nice slabs, you get instants. Um, problem two um, is coming from relativity theory, just special relativity, um, which is rather than instance, relativistic becoming has to happen at a point rather than a reason, uh, region. Um, so those two problems which I'll outline um, but I think there's also um, I think there's also some help to be had from Whitehead here um, and the, the two notions of time he has he has the extensive extensive continuum which gives you coordinate time the, the t coordinates um, in, in your space-time theory but there's also this process of becoming so distinguishing between those can help us here I think um, okay, so why must events be projections, whatever they are? Well, um, it's an essential feature of events. Um, this is this is in Whitehead um, that they're um, an objectification or limitation. Um, that is, they they close off possibilities. So, if an event happens one way, then there are a whole load of other ways that it did not happen. Um, it, it's a definite happening. Um, so in probability theory, um, we condition on the occurrence of a, an event to obtain conditional probabilities, reflecting that closing off of what um, didn't happen in a further assignment of probabilities. Quantum mechanics is a probabilistic theory. Um, unfortunately, things are a bit more complicated, but we have um, Luna's rule, um, which gives us the closest thing we have to conditional probabilities in, in quantum mechanics. It's a sort of conditionalization of a state based on measurement. Um, unfortunately, that gives conditional probabilities only when conditioning on um, projections. Um, well, fortunately, I mean, it's, it's a nice result in a way. <laughs> um, what is a projection? Well, it's it's an operator that when you operate on a quantum state, uh, if you do it once, it's the same as doing it twice, or the other way around. So PP equals P. That's all there is to being a projection operator. Um, so if collapse is to be an event, this process one is to be an, an event, um, it has to play this role of objectification, limitation, um, so it must be a projection, but there are no temporally extended projections. Um, so that's um, related to a result called Pauli's theorem, also closely related to the quantum Zeno effect. So what that means is we've got claps at an instant of time. Um, so this is uh, time here. We could have claps as, as, as an instant, but uh, problem two is that our instant uh, unbounded three-dimensional space is uh, in relativity theory going to have to be a point. So um, I'll, I'll just try to, to quickly lay that argument out. So this goes back to the 1960s um, debate between Hilary Putnam um, and uh, Wright Dick. I'm, no, I, I won't try and say that. <laughs> I can never, uh, I should have 
excise that from the slide so I didn't have to try and pronounce it. Um, so Putnam, in a famous argument, um, a paper called Time and Physical Geometry, argues that special relativity entails eternalism. Um, why? Because he says the only the only relation of becoming um, would have to have all events in space-time in its domain. So it's things can only happen all together. Um, all of space-time has to be fixed determinates there eternally. Um, but Howard Stein responded that um, that conclusion was too quick. There's another. Um, there's another possibility. And um, that possibility for the relation RAB, namely event A has become as of event B, um, is just that um, the, the present, uh, these multiple presents are point events rather than um, slices. So you can either have everything happening at once, eternalism, or you can have uh, this sort of multiply becoming universe where um, pick an event, um, the past of that event has become relative to that event, and the future is, is yet to become, uh, and also the relativistic elsewhere. So everything outside the past light cone, which I'm going to illustrate in a second. Okay, so this is fully compatible with um, Tomonaga Schwinger, but obviously not with this idea of epochal becoming these slabs of space-time coming into being. Um, okay, so just to sort of sum that up, so in, in Newtonian space-time, we have uh, a succession of um, a succession of three-dimensional presence, so T axis going up the side here. Um, that this is a, a total order. So there's, there's um, we, of any two, we can say which is before the other, um, but it's a dense order. So there is no next present. So it's not a serial order. Um, and this is something that Whitehead was, was quite aware of. So um, in between these two moments, there's another one here. And in between these two, there's another one here. So that means that there's no sense to saying the next um, three-dimensional slice is going to come into being because there is no next in, um, in a dense order. Um, so in einstein minkowski space-time, we have a choice um, as you're probably aware we have a um, we have a relativity of simultaneity so that's a uh, non-unique total order of these three-dimensional presents or we have um, a unique partial order on point events and what that means is if we have I've realized that I'm I as I suspect I've bitten off a bit more than I can chew here so uh, I'll, I, I, there may be some that I have to leave off. But here, here the thought is, okay, here are some point events. Here are their past light cones. So these, these are all events in here that are determinately before this event and also determinately before these later events. Um, so this is the, the partial order because according to this notion, um, according to this notion, distant events happen neither before nor after. So it's just the events in the past light cone that happened before. Something over here, um, we don't get to say whether it's before or after. Um, but this sort of lies underneath the, um, the idea of a, a relative relativity of simultaneity namely this non-unique total order. So the thought there is, um, see if I can get some different colors. The thought there is that, well, I could draw my presence in such a way that they connect these, but an equally, equally good way of, of drawing these presence 
would involve um, linking together, say, events like this. And now in, um, in uh, relativistic quantum field theory in Tomonaga Schwinger, we can say with, with, with Stutt that the, these non-unique um, these non-unique three-dimensional presence unfolding in, in whatever way we choose um, contain the same physics. Why? Because what happens at a point depends only on its past, depends only on its past light cone. Um, and so we're sort of getting, um, we're getting uh, a non-unique representation of the local physics and um, the local physics is what gives us this unique partial order. So distant events, neither before nor after. Okay, and I don't don't want to abuse my <laughs> abuse my position as chair to go on too far. Um, so the upshots, events must be points um, rather than space-time slaps, which is a bit uncomfortable for white for a Whiteheadian. Um, and we have a concrete example now. The, uh, the flash ontology of, of John Bell uh, led Roderick Tomolka to develop a relativistic um, flash ontology. And that is um, absolutely dependent. Um, the fact that it's relativistic depends on those flashes being points. Um, so this is just for a single electron, although the, the, there are some later developments. Um, we're looking for a um, a quantum field theory, which allows particle number to vary. That's the key thing. Um, and I think the, uh, the, best, the best hope for an event ontology for um, quantum field theory is um, rather than Tom and Arger and Schwinger, um, is to look to Feynman. So um, these, these three physicists shared the Nobel Prize for their work on, on, on quantum field theory. Um, Tom Nigel Schwinger had this sort of space-time formalism, and um, Feynman based his on, on these diagrams, which are sort of loosely space-time diagrams. So um, with time going up the page, we have a process here, which is the, um, the mutual annihilation of an electron and a positron to create a photon, a gamma ray. Um, and you can also have a gamma ray annihilating to create a pair of electrons, uh, a, pair of, a pair of one electron and one positron. Um, but also just if you've got an electron um, going through space, not being annihilated, well, how does, it, how does it change its direction? Well, it does so by emitting or absorbing a photon. So this is, this is uh, quantum electrodynamics um, and it seems to me that the, the Whiteheadian should be concerned with these interactions. So these vert vertices are points, they're point events, and they're relationships, dynamical relationships, interactions um, between, say, over here, an electron and the field. So we don't want to reify the particles, reify the interactions, and we, we get um, uh, ontology. So I think that's probably a good point for me to stop, but I I will just sort of sum up um, the, the later point that I wanted to make. So um, I've argued that, you know, for mathematical region, reasons, essentially, for, for, for reasons of how we, um, how we formulate quantum mechanics and, and special relativity mathematically, that we end up with events happening at points. Um, but it's important to note that within Whitehead, we have these two notions of time. So we have the extensive continuum, which um, in which Whitehead um, logically constructs points. So this, this is a, a phrase developed by Bertrand Russell, um, points are logical, constructions, essentially for, for Whitehead in, in earlier work, you construct a point as a nested family of regions. So there's nothing there that has zero extension, 
you look at the whole collection, which might have infinitely many regions, um, well, which will in, in, a, in a continuous um, space time. And that gives you a, a point. So uh, and maybe I could just go back to this. So in Science in the Modern World, we have Whitehead um, approving of, of Kant's here um, claim about space and time. Um, space consists of spaces only, time of times, points and moments are only limits. And that's taken directly from Aristotle, um, Physics Book 4. Um, so if the points are logical constructions um, in, a, in a theory of time, in a relational theory of time, such as Russell's, um, those, um, those point events are really limits. So Aristotle says the now is um, a shared limit of past and future. It separates past events from future events and uh, knits together time. It's a potential rather than an actual division. So um, taking that idea to Whitehead, you would be able to say, well, these events, these point events, these um, vertices in a, in a Feynman diagram are really separating off the, the past from the future, all the times before there was this, this particle in the world from all the uh, times or events um, after which this, this, this particle is a fact of life. Um, so th this is compatible with um, a growing block model. Um, and if you were to further suggest along the lines of Whitehead's apocal theory of time, that um, underlying the extensive continuum is a is a plenum. So these these extended events, which this is a sort of theory of space, an Aristotelian theory of space is a plenum, where there are no no gaps. Um, that that would um, that would allow you to say that okay, point events are not um, happening. They're, they're these, these cuts in a, in a plenum. Um, and if correct, this would help with um, a problem that anyone who knows um, about Feynman diagrams would be worried by, namely that it's hard to give a realistic, realistic interpretation of them. So I apologize for going over. That really wasn't my intention. I, I, I um, but I did manage to say the things I wanted to say. This, this is the risk of having the, the chair as the commentator. I'm sorry. Um, so we do have um, we do have plenty of time for questions, and I see um, I see a question uh, from Michael, uh, and I'm going to avoid saying your last name if I may. <laughs> Would you um, would you like to to unmute yourself and give your question? Is it Phil Stempowski? Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Go ahead, Phil. Oh no, uh, I didn't raise the question. It was uh, Michael? Yes. You said. Michael uh, Zygmunt. I'm just going to go there and say it. Okay. Um, where's DeMarco? Sorry for the delay there. My my trackpad wasn't wasn't working. Actually, I was just in the middle of maybe switching my, my question because I, I I jotted the question uh, originally for um, you know after your talk uh, your response, Thomas, it sort of changed my focus. I'll go ahead and ask the original question though, and that's basically how to count. Quantum events, um, you know. Um, McHenry was saying that uh, you know, coin coin was on your was on your list of of uh, influences and seemed to remain on the list. He's notorious for the idea of no entity without identity. I don't know any uh, canonical way of counting quantum events, not least because of the differences of an interpretation that you mentioned. So on a, on a, on any of the collapse interpretations, you know, the collapse of the waveforms of an important quantum event. The other you know, non-collapse uh, readings, those aren't events at all. So 
if if you're going to take an event ontology, how do you how do you count how do you count the uh, uh, the, the events? Uh, and again, vague suggestions are in this context uh, welcome. Given oh. given <laughs> if there's time, I got another question for Tom. But let let me let me leave that. Uh, that's plenty. Thank you. So is is that a question for me or Tom? That's a that's a question for you actually. Or, or okay. That's okay. Okay. Well, I I guess I'm not quite clear why this is relevant. I mean, why is it, why is somehow or other counting quantum events um, uh, look problematic for an event ontology? Well, not just for an event ontology in general, but but you seemed, maybe I read you incorrectly, uh, to endorse Quine. So if you can't, you gotta be able to count them. To count them, you gotta be able to identify them. And um, if not, then there's no, then there's nothing there significant enough to and determinately enough to base your ontology on that, that's my worry that i'm 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 raising that worry for you for an event yeah. ontology. If, so, if you're so quiet if you're quiet enough now maybe maybe you've let that go which would be a difficult yeah. well i mean in uh sort of discussing the event ontology within the context of all these different philosophers you know i was looking for their commonality um, and I've actually written a couple of papers where I've criticized Quine on his extensionalism, and he actually responded to me uh, in print. And then I wrote another paper after, after he had died on this because I was very puzzled about his, uh, his response on this. And it seemed to me that he had, he had missed something important. But in any case, um, I think that that sort of uh, extensionalism, as you quoted, you know, no entity without identity here, was, was one part that was problematic for advancing the event ontology in, in the kind of Russell Whitehead model. Um, but I'm, I'm going, trying to go back to my original sort of puzzlement here about why um, it would be important in, in, in terms of sort of like as you as you said, this is some somehow a, a problem of of counting uh, quantum events. Um, I'm I'm not quite sort of following that point, but I think you know in terms of Quine's extensionalism, he was thinking of these um, space time regions uh, and you know identifying objects in these space time regions by their kind of like um, underlying grid in a kind of geometry. Of space time, which uh, you know would be a purely extensionalist view of this and a purely quantitative view of this. Um, but I don't think he was actually thinking in terms of counting quantum phenomenon. Tom? Um, yeah, so, so are you asking for my response to the question or should we go on to the next one? No. Yeah, no, response to that question, yeah. All right, well, I, I was reminded there of um, um, a debate between Davidson, who you mentioned, and and, mm -hmm. and Quine, where uh, Davidson thought that you could um, individuate um, individuate events um, just by reference mm -hmm. to their, their place in the, in the causal nexus. Um, and then he was browbeaten by Quine into, into conceding that that, could not work, um, but I think um, I think uh, more recent developments, or actually some of these things that Quine himself proposed, would suggest that um, uh, you can have a, a a relational identity, a sort of qualitative structural identity with within a network. Um, so um, there is there is that possibility, but um, what would probably lead Quine to say that that um, he he was right is that um, it seems you need to assume numerical diversity as a primitive. Um, mm. So the, the sort of counting of, of events sort of has has to be put in by by hand. Um, but this is the task for these these primitive ontologies, such as um, uh, as the flash ontology. Which which supplements um, quantum theory, you know, te textbook quantum theory. So where you're being explicit about your ontology, 
I think you can um, you can you can bring in um, your your notion of identity along with the ontology rather than the physics. That, that certainly helps to put it in in sort of Davidsonian terms. Uh, uh, Vincent, is, is this a comment? Would you? Uh, you're still muted. It's actually a question. Is that okay? Um, yes, yes, go ahead. We're, um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'll figure out the order. Okay. Thank you, both speaker and commentator. I have a very naive question. Um, Lehman, you, you gestured towards the initial or opening plenary in the morning. And I wonder what, if any, of the implications of your project for the kind of ontological pluralism being championed uh, this morning. And that's a question to me. Uh, yeah, actually, primarily to you, but also the yeah. commentator. Could... Okay, well, I'll, I'll give the first shot at it. I, I missed a good bit of that because um, I'm, I'm on the I'm in Los Angeles, and it was really early in the morning for me. But from what I did sort of see, it looked like there was a lot of agreement here on this sort of nat what I'm calling the naturalized metaphysics and and the general sort of um, 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 uh, presentation of science as being continuous with philosophy and metaphysics and um, th that being a part of the sort of naturalistic enterprise, which, by the way, was a term that was coined by Quine. But where's the pluralism? Yes, it's that it's that part that I didn't I didn't okay. quite get there. from the talk because I would. Yeah, so let's 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 move um, through the questions. So I have well, let I, I have a request to to read out Michael's question. So he he asks. Uh, Lehman, you began by stating these ideas reflect your thinking in 2015 when the book was published, but it now seems like another lifetime. Uh, why? Where has your thinking taken you since then? Oh, well, uh, since retiring from university, I've, I've gone to work for a law firm and I've been become involved with evidence-based medicine and the problems of the integrity of clinical trials. So that's why it took me so long to write this book, The Event Universe, because I was writing another book at the time on evidence-based medicine, but that's just a practical matter. Um, okay, so next in the queue, I have um, George Allen. Oh, I'm not hearing you. George, you're still muted. Uh, uh, I was trying to unmute myself. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hello, George. We got Hi. you. Um, I don't, a point instant, I mean, a point uh, event is a contradiction in terms, right? Mm -hmm. So the more thing that Thomas does here, he undercuts the whole notion of an event, which is, which is a duration, not a point and not an extension. That is, it's a temporal extension. And if you build from those, you, 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 you're going to, I mean, you, you can't have something, well, your point with a lot of little area around it is precisely what an event is. And events, of course, are connected to one another. They don't have space between them because the, the um, um, features of, of the event as it emerges is the raw material for the, um, the, the predecessor that's emerging. There's no space between them. Um, but but it would seem to me that you would then start to talk about things in terms of, I mean, you can talk about four dimensional um, things in terms of the the uh, dimensions, physical dimensions of an object and this temporal, but all of that is temporal. Yeah. Um, so that so that the the one thing that had x t comes a little closer uh, to it. Uh, and so, so I wondered, I wondered, uh, 
uh, Lehman in particular, um, what you think about uh, that keeping that part of uh, of Whitehead, and and then taking it seriously. I take it there's nothing as 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 such at rest. At rest is a form of motion hmm. uh, because everything is is every if everything is an event, it's being recreated and replaced immediately. So you don't have anything that endures except the trail, the story, as it were, of a sequence of events. So no um, point. <laughs> yeah. The point is an abstraction that is useful in science, but not in, right. if, uh, not in ontology. So I thought Tom's point was that we've got two different concepts of an event here. We've got Whitehead's concept of an event, which is necessarily a quantum, a duration of some sort, which cannot be viewed as an instantaneous kind of uh, point. And what is being seen as sort of orthodox in uh, quantum interpretations of these events as, as he put it, instantaneous projections. Uh, and and, the, and the, question, the question here is he's thinking that um, Whitehead's view was problematic from the point of view of attempting to reconcile this with physics. Um, and, and so I, uh, George, I tend to think that, um, you know, the, that the Whiteheadian conception is the only one that really makes sense to me because, you know, it looked like Whitehead had destroyed this concept of, of, of points as existing entities. They were only arrived at through the method of extensive abstraction and had to be sort of treated as nothing but these kinds of fictions that were useful in mathematics. So when the physicist says, you know, force at a point or something like that, that's just a sort of matter matter of speaking. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Tom to see if I basically understood you correctly on that point. Yeah, so I think, I mean, one thing I want to say is that the, the flash ontology, these, these space-time points that are supposed to somehow together make up um, enduring pieces of matter, I think Whitehead would have thought of as, as the, the, uh, the worst kind of fallacy of misplaced concreteness. Right. Yeah. A uh, point by definition, I mean, that's Newton's problem, right? He, yeah. he takes a bunch of points and, and so many points are aligned, but that's always in an infinite number. And uh, it, it, it becomes immediately incoherent. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I really see Whitehead as, as carrying on a sort of Aristotelian tradition. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so the... Without substances. Yeah, um, yeah an Arist Aristotelian tradition of thinking about time. Sorry, I should have been more specific. Right. Um, and yeah, so my... Um, I, I was um, I was very worried about this because the, these problems that I that I raised because I you know I rather like Whitehead and I'd, uh, I I too agree that these these points seem to be um, seem to be rather too abstract to do to the work of ontology, um, but yeah I think I think the resources of a relational theory of time and, and thinking about the extensive continuum. Um, allow us to reinterpret the, the points of, of physics um, as something um, more like a, a Dedekind cup which, uh, to which Whitehead often refers in, in the Harvard lectures that we have the text of and, um, and also sort of implicitly in, in process of reality. So I think that the, 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 there are resources in Whitehead um, to avoid this conclusion. Um, so I have, um, in my queue, I have uh, George Lucas um, and uh, Richard Velkley, and before that, I'll, I will just read a message that was sent to me uh, by Timothy Eastman, um, just saying, uh, thanking us for our presentations and just noting the, um, the extension of the Whitehead approach using category theory um, by Epperson and uh, Zephyrus in their Foundations of uh, Relational Realism in 2013. Um, also, Ruth Kastner's work on, on her um, event possibility, um, student of, former student of Jeff Boobs, 
Um, and also uh, Tim Eastman's um, recent book, Untying the Gordian Knot uh, Process Reality and Context that uh, came out rather recently in December 2020. So some, um, some further reading if, uh, if anyone is looking for such. Um, okay, so, uh, George Lucas. Let's see, am I unmuted here? Yes, okay. Um, yeah, again, thanks Lehman and Tom for this splendid presentation. Glad to finally have you two together and able to speak, even though still not in person. We'll work on that. Um, I wanted to go back to, uh, I'd actually typed this out in my queue before uh, um, Vince raised, uh, Vince Cole Pietro raised the question about our discussions this morning and how they kind of jived um, and supported the efforts the two of you are undertaking here. Um, I thought that, um, let's start with the, the role of philosophy, irrespective of Weinberg's kind of dismissive view of philosophy that Hawking's critique of philosophy and philosophers was directed largely at the later Wittgenstein and the linguistic turn. It was that Hawking believed that had nothing to offer physics and represented a kind of impoverished intellectual framework. Whereas the kind of things we were talking about this morning um, sort of went well beyond the linguistic turn uh, in philosophy. And De Caro's account of liberal naturalism the pluralistic account, seems an approach that's open to the kind of synoptic unifying work that many of these thinkers, um, uh, Stab, Bell, uh, Lehman himself, and Tom, you, and others have proposed to undertake or are undertaking or have undertaken. Um, and if we don't have that kind of work, um, in contrast to Weinberg, uh, dismissive view, then what happens as De Caro indicated this morning, the philosophical assumptions of physicists simply get subsumed in their work without critical, any critical awareness of flaws or shortcomings. Uh, and so my question is in part, do you agree with that, especially when as we look, as Lehman was looking, where do we find places we have to truncate individual theories in order to get them to unify, fit together with others, um, that Einstein, as we learned uh, Nancy Frankenberry's meeting in Cambridge about three years ago, was a thoroughgoing Spinozist. I mean, read Spinoza, um, was devoted to Spinoza, and the atemporal um, natura naturans, I think, would be the, the right thing in his case, um, was the manifold, space-time manifold that uh, Einstein himself envisioned. He was just simply thinking out what uh, the geometry of ethics in Spinoza would look like. Uh, but that's not a critical uh, approach. It's, it's an appreciative um, sort of um, embrace by Einstein of something that the philosophers might find you know, inadequate. Um, you know, the problem with Spinoza is precisely it's not temporal, and we need a, a temporal version of Spinozism, which, by the way, is how Whitehead in Science of the Modern World described initially the uh, uh, event metaphysics that he was outlining. Uh, it was a temporalized Spinozism, uh, and that's going to work a lot better with something like quantum theory than would an atemporal original. Spinozism that Einstein absorbed. So all this is the role that philosophy, constructive role that philosophy can and should play in physics. Um, and it seems to me that that on this account is a fairly substantial one. Do you agree? Both of you, but maybe leave in first. Well, um, first of all, I um, certainly agree that um, it's bad philosophy that has given scientists this idea that philosophy has nothing to contribute to science. Um, 
And that bad philosophy, I think, was you know largely this kind of philosophy that views itself as um, having no nothing empirical can have any relevance to the sort of speculations of of philosophy and what you end up with is this sort of self-contained uh, intellectual puzzle. Uh, that certainly has nothing to sort of contribute to science. And so anybody reading that kind of philosophy would naturally come up with that conception. Um, however, in the case of Hawking, he was actually a not a lot nastier in the sense that he was criticizing um, the philosophers for poaching on the territory of physics. Mm -hmm. And he sort of regarded these people as failures in physics, and that's why they did philosophy. Well, <laughs> that's not quite right. I mean, we go into philosophy for very, yes, different, very different reasons. <laughs> in one case. Uh, but in any case, uh, I had written one of the earliest reviews of Hawking's, Hawking's book and where I criticized him for confusing different kinds of approaches here, a realist approach, an instrumentalist approach, and all of this got mixed up. Um, and his res response was that, well, you know, f scientists just don't think in the same categories that philosophers think in. And we certainly don't, don't have our successes by thinking in the same kinds of patterns in which philosophers think. <clears throat> so, I, yeah, I think my, my answer would be one word, yes. But um, also, just to sort of comment, I think um, physicists tend to be sort of philosophical magpies. Um, so they'll they'll grab all sorts of things that seem to be interesting and, and helpful, but perhaps not worry too much about whether they all fit together. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. so, and I think that's um, perhaps often, uh, that would perhaps also characterize Einstein. Um, but I, I won't go into that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I we're we're running out of time. But I have uh, Richard Belkley in, in the queue, and then finally Timothy Eastman. So we'll we'll take those two, um, and then and then we'll wrap things up. So yeah, go ahead. Oh, oh all right. Thank you. Um, both presentations were very interesting. Uh, I just wanted to say in response to George Allen's point that. Uh, we can take another 17th century figure, uh, Leibniz, who uh, understands, uh, you know, nature is made up of indivisible points that are, however, centers of activity. I mean, it's a rather paradoxical notion, but they have an internal principle of change, although they are unextended. And uh, well, he tries to understand that as perception, something that requires no extension. Uh, and the phenomenal world emerges out of it out of the, you know, the joint operation of the monads, so that you have a kind of continuous world all the same, out of arising out of the, the discontinuous points. And, uh, you know, I think it's probably of no interest to contemporary physicists, uh, <laughs> but uh, I've, I've always think, I've always thought that Leibniz is really more interesting than many people do. And I think, in fact, the pre-established harmony is a, it's a kind of foil that misleads one making leading one to think into it that it is something more mechanistic and uh uh, uh you know a kind of uh, deus ex machina universe but in fact i think it's the continuous world emerges out of a certain interaction between the the uh the points of activity maybe the flash ontology has some kinship with that but uh that's all that's all i would say if you have any thought on that. Uh, well, one, one brief comment. Um, a colleague of mine at um, Oxford, Simon Saunders, has proposed a um, an interpretation of, of quantum physics in, term of the, in terms of the monadology. So he, he thinks that there's a quite literal way of thinking about quantum mechanics as sort of embodying the, the monadology. Is that Smolin? Uh, sorry, Saunders, Simon Saunders. Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, all right. I did a bit of reading of that. Yes. Uh, so we, yeah, we have um, Tim Eastman. Please go ahead. Oh, uh, <clears throat> well, as a uh, physicist, although my specialty is space plasma physics, uh, uh, with, you know, sort of 
getting involved with uh, philosophy to varying degrees. Uh, I concur very much with uh, the uh, last couple of comments about the importance of these kinds of philosophical investigations and analysis for the physics. Uh, one of the I think, impediments of some developments in modern physics has to do with the tendency for the physicists to presuppose certain elements of a classical uh, Newtonian physical worldview and, and drag it into uh, attempts at interpretation of results in modern physics. And I think that's a, a, a stumbling block for uh, some efforts to understand issues of symmetry and asymmetry of the many worlds interpretation versus other approaches of trying to get at a uh, realistic interpretation versus epi more epistemological oriented ones in quantum physics and so forth. So I, I think the kind of work that's being done in this meeting is key to helping to address these things uh, in the future. And, uh, and so th those of you, uh, well, you know, say with your work, Thomas, in philosophy of physics. So I think I uh, admire your efforts to then really work with this group because I think it's important to helping the physicists eventually. Uh, Feynman in his uh, denial of, so to speak, the relevance of philosophy, in my view, is just radically mistaken. It's key. And in fact, Feynman himself made advances by his own kind of philosophical nuances that went beyond the physics. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think the response, except that I see one more question if we have time, but I don't want to, we're drifting into the reception, I think. Yeah. Let's, let's do it from Lisa, yeah, that's. Let's, let's have one final question from Lisa. Oh, you're, you're still muted, Lisa. I was going to say, I was just writing you to say no worries, because that was a wonderful note, uh, point to end on. It, it was more a question for both of you um, about how, when we're speaking in terms of durations and no longer in terms of points and instants, except by way of abstraction, um, what you make of, of, yeah. of Whitehead's actual worlds talk and the relativity of actual worlds and how that might affect um, talk about the world right, in general, philosophically speaking. Um, so I just wanted to hear you say a little bit about that and how that might affect a, a unification project as opposed to say maybe a multiplication project. Lehman? Oh, you, you can have that one, Tom. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. Um, so you're thinking of something like the reformed subjectivist principle, sort of the, oh. yeah, go ahead. Well, also just when he's talking about um, uh, time systems, right? The relativity of time systems and how if we speak a space, we're really just talking about the order of coexistences. But if contemporaneity is relative, then space is relative, temporality is relative, right? And so no one actual world is ever duplicated. Um, actual worlds themselves or the cone paths that you drew, Tom, that I thought were really helpful, um, those are unique, right? Unrepeatable. So there is no the world or the actual world to talk about, right? So then how do we how do we reconcile unification project with those implications? Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting question. Um, I, I think Whitehead's thoughts in on, on this in the in the Harvard lectures just seem to drop directly out of thinking of relativity. So this this idea that um, an actual occasion, has its own unique past and uh, contem contemporaneous um, events are, um, are independent in a very real sense. Um, he says leads, uh, that's the foundation of freedom in the world that um, each actual occasion has its, its own past and there's an independence of becoming. So you, you get this, this picture of, um, of, of sort of um, individual becoming, but um, togetherness because of the shared um, past. They don't have the same past, but any two events have have a shared uh, region that is their past. So for me, th this actually just drops straight out of of, of relativity, and I think Whitehead himself um, read it off. 
um, the theory of, of, of relativity. And then I think it's a really important um, um, aspect of his metaphysics. One of the reasons it's so attractive for me is that he really builds in these relativistic considerations from the ground up. Um, you know, the concept of societies, though, I mean, isn't that as fundamental? Sorry to interrupt, but... Uh, um, yeah, so, yeah. So, societies are then um, sort of linked by this, this shared past. They don't have, no two entities um, have the same past, but they have a common past. Right, okay. So that, that's how they sort of uh, condition one another. I think that's Whitehead's language. Okay, so yeah, let's um, let's wrap things up and let me um, just say it's a great privilege to to take part in um, in this session. I'm I'm very glad to be here. It's um, it's been a long a long standing ambition to talk about Whitehead among uh, among friends in this sort of forum. So I'm, I'm really glad to have had this opportunity. Um, Thank you very much for organizing it and posting it. Oh, thank you. Bravo all. Wonderful. Okay.